ni mala kulen ich balanker ni mata te er kuyu la coca chawet kun kah mulo is mu kah mu hakagatlem alerisim bokti kite kah komoli harikate kocha baha shu ya kawa shu ya kana o shiki toka matete mari shina kasba rukini shim dikun kina awa jala ni macho ka ishi apo ishi mi shok ishi te en pasika ya la sha ti hato pi hari ko shuku che kawa hanel kukumat satu shani ishi mule Mari Mari, uh, my name is Amalia Cordova. I'm the Supervisory Museum Curator at the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage and co-director of the Mother Tongue Film Festival. I'd like to welcome you to our seventh edition, which is also our second virtual festival. Thank you very much for joining us. I wanna first acknowledge uh, with respect the Piscataway Nation on whose traditional territory the Smithsonian has uh, been built and whose relationship uh, to the lands west of the Chesapeake Bay continue until today. We have real-time captioning for this program in English, and we have American Sign Language interpretation available. To view the captions, please visit the link provided in the comment section. And if you're viewing this program after our live broadcast, it will be available on our website with closed captioning. Um, Para nuestro público en español, no tendremos traducción simultánea en esta ocasión, pero recomendamos ver por YouTube activando la traducción automatizada y pronto subiremos una traducción completa del conversatorio en español. Muchas gracias. Cindy. Cindy Benitez, Program Manager at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. Mother Tongue is an effort of recovering voices, a cross Smithsonian initiative involving the National Museum of Natural History, the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage, the National Museum of the American Indian and the Asian Pacific American Center. We are grateful to our Smithsonian and additional partners for their support and extend our thanks to our sponsors, especially to the Embassy of Canada and the government of Quebec in Washington for their support for this event. Today, we welcome you to our Women Directors Panel, a conversation that we always have at the Mother Tongue Film Festival that is associated to our online program called Centering Women's Voices. We'll be taking your comments and questions in the live chat, so please participate. And if you haven't seen the films yet, you can still see them until tomorrow, except for Bootlegger, which was our opening night film. If you're new to the festival, I do encourage you to visit mothertongue.si.edu to see more films. Your feedback is also welcome through our social media channels at any time. With us today are four extraordinary women directors who bring us stories protagonized by women. We are so glad you could join us today. Bienvenidas. Hola, hola, gracias. Hola. Hola, hi everyone. Um, hi. Hi. Um, if you could each introduce yourselves and tell us a bit about where you're from. Um, Caroline, would, would you like to go first? Yes, of course, uh, quickly. I'm uh, Caroline Monet. I'm currently based in Montreal. I'm a filmmaker and visual artist, but I grew up uh, between the Utah region, um, more, more known as Gatineau, and uh, Brittany, France. My uh, mother's family is from Kirigan City. And uh, yes, really happy to be here. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Tanya? Bushu, 
Anin, Tanya Talaga Nagisnikas, Ka Musko Pimushije Pinishish Nagisnikas. Hi, everyone. I'm very um, thrilled to be here today. This is a real honor to be here with all of you incredible women. And I just want to say, Miigwech for inviting me and for doing this, Cindy and Amelia. It's wonderful. Um, I am coming to you actually right now from uh, Newfoundland, um, but traditionally I am from, and I make my home in Takaranto. My mom is from Fort William First Nation, which is Thunder Bay, Anishinaabe, mm -hmm. and my father was Polish Canadian. Eris? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Um, Thank you, everyone. It's an honor to be here. My name is Eris. My pronouns are she, her. I'm originally from China. Um, I'm born and raised there. Um, my parents are from different regions, but um, in general, the Yangtze Delta. Um, I um, used to work at the Smithsonian at the Natural History Museum. So it's really like a homecoming experience for me. And I'm really excited to share uh, the story of mother tongue with all of you. Wonderful. And Adriana. Hi, everyone. I'm Adriana Otero. I'm from Yucatan, Mexico, and I'm a filmmaker. And my work has been more focused on documentary film, mostly about um, subjects about uh, Mayan communities. And it is a genre that I like because I learn a lot about life and culture, and I enjoy um, sharing with the with the protagonists and i try that my work can function as a bridge to share the stories and messages that i consider interesting for me and for other people and i'm very happy to participate in this panel thank you very much uh everybody and thank you very much adriana um we're really honored we uh, could never have imagined when we started this festival that it would be a staple to have a, a women directors panel. And we've never uh, been at a lack of talent and, and we're, we're always having new discoveries during these conversations. So thank you. Um, we don't really have a thematic festival. Uh, the Mother Tongue Film Festival is its own thing, but the films themselves bring us certain topics and that determines our theme this year. And the theme this year is about how our ancestors and the past guide us through difficult times and help us build or rebuild our future. And each of your films really elaborates on this theme, but we also wanna hear about the stories behind the films themselves and the filmmaking process. I'm gonna begin with uh, Tanya. You're an incredibly accomplished journalist and language advocate and written two books. And I understand that this is actually your first documentary film which debuted at the Hot Docs International Film Festival in Toronto, where it won the Audience Award for Mid-Length Feature and was also nominated for Best Documentary at the American Indian Film Festival, which is a shout out to that sister festival. Can you start by telling us what drew you to tell these really challenging stories that you've brought us and through the documentary format? Miigwech, uh, thanks for that question. Um, this was my first documentary and I had no idea how difficult they are. Um, you know, and I'm used to um, working alone. Um, I've been a long time journalist and a writer. Um, as you said, I, I've written two books and um, I'm used to spending a lot of time by myself researching and writing and mm. filmmaking is the 100% opposite of that. It's so collaborative. Yes. Um, and that was uh, that was something I learned. To be quite honest with you, um, I learned a lot about documentary filmmaking. Um, and I always wanted to do this. I wanted to take my first book, Seven Fallen Feathers, about um, the lives and deaths of seven First Nations students, um, high school students who had to leave their homes and their communities and their families and their language, everything they knew, mm -hmm. Um, and go to Thunder Bay because they don't have high schools in their home communities. Right. You know, high school education is the right of any other child in this country. So I wrote a book about it. And um, after the book was uh, published, I really wanted to do a film. And I, um, I didn't know how to do that. Um, to be honest with you, I started speaking to a few directors and, um, and it took me almost four years to get the film all together. 
Um, we finished it in COVID. And of course, there's a, a version in English in Anishinaabewewin, and then there's a version completely in Anishinaabewewin. So that is uh, my mother's mother tongue. So my mother tongue too. Um, but, you know, and we can talk about that too, because I only speak, you know, maybe 20 words and mm -hmm. phrases. So I'm doing a film in a language that um, um, that's difficult. We can talk about that later. Um, but important because, you know, there's so many different dialects as well of Anishinaabewewin, of uh, Ojibwe, right? I mean, like the language that I speak would be diff different from Carolyn's um, family, for instance. Um, yet we're technically almost the same people. Um, and so um, so that definitely is something. Um, and it was it was an incredible experience. You know, um, I did everything. I executive produced it. I co-directed it with the incredible Michelle DeRosier, who really took me by the hand and showed me how to do this. Without her, the film would not have happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I, I picked up the crew. I drove them around. I made them dinner. You know, I made hotel bookings. Like I did everything, which was probably the best because it was such a great learning tool and I, I actually think as a storyteller of um i'm i'm very grateful to be a storyteller for my communities in the north um i felt that this was a logical extension of the book um to visually show the story um yeah. to everyone and people could see the land as a character mm -hmm. because the land is alive you know the water is alive um to see what what we do and who we are as people. And to me, I could write about that, but visually I wanted to bring that. And that's why I, I went down the documentary path. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was incredible experience. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tanya. That was incredible. I mean, we can go on and on and talk about, you know, the process of filmmaking and like, you know, first time experiences. And um, Caroline, um, this is actually your first dramatic feature. I mean, I've followed your work for so many years. Um, incredible Rolodex of films that you've had, experimental, dramatic, doc, you've done it all. And um, for Bootlegger, um, in this film, there seems, there's like a generational shift or rift regarding like the sales of alcohol um, on the reserve. Now, how did you decide that as your first feature that this is the topic that you wanted to approach and have it actually entirely shot on the reserve itself? I don't think it was planned that this topic would be my first feature. It just kind of happened. I started when I started writing this film more than five years ago. I realized how our common histories, like Canadians just didn't know about our common histories and they didn't know much about the out, outdated paternalistic laws um, that are from the Indian Act. They didn't even know what the Indian Act uh, was and that it still existed today. So I wanted to bring that uh, to the forefront and talk about this. Uh, but it was also really just an excuse to talk about assimilation politics and, and really uh, the consequences it has on families and on communities still today. I was just thinking about my grandfather who, you know, raised uh, six kids and um, First Nation people have the right to drink alcohol only in the 1960s. And, you know, he would raise six kids, would be working really hard and not uh, be allowed to have a beer at the end of a, of a work day or even have the choice, you know, just for himself to take that choice. Um, and if he would uh, take a beer, he would be put into prison. So I was just really thinking about that. Why are we considered so uh, different from the rest of, you know, Canadian citizens? And it's really at the root of the, the uh, what I wanted to do. But also at the time I was writing this film, I was seeing a lot of uh, communities uh, in the news, reading in the news, a lot of communities across Canada that were doing referendums on uh, whether or not they wanted to continue prohibition in their community. And I thought it was such an interesting social debate because it really polarizes uh, communities. It's either black or white. And I think it's much more complex than that. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's a gray zone and it's not a cause. It's, um, it's, it's much more deeper than that. And um, I think bootlegger in uh, in the end is really a story about resilience and how and the strength that is carried across generation and 
um, this topic was just a way to really bring that um, into this film. Uh, and I chose the fiction narrative form because I felt these are, are stories that need to be carried through characters and through um, personal journeys. Um, so that's why I was able to explore that a little bit more through the characters. Yeah, both of the, your films are touching on issues that are really relevant and prevalent in, in First Nations territories and communities and that don't get very sympathetic or, or holistic coverage in the national media, right? So they're like, they perpetuate stigmas and stereotypes instead of really give a humane approach. So the, I love the work that these films are doing, both in documentary and, and fiction, to really bring human face, human emotion and experience and healing into this conversation and agency, right? So um, they're very powerful and we're really honored to have them this year at, at the festival. Um, Adriana, um, I worked a lot with I work a lot with Mexican uh, filmmakers, indigenous filmmakers, and communities, and I know that Mexico has this like vibrant and thriving film industry. But you've chosen the uphill battle of working in the documentary format, and, and not in the fiction, and working with Mayan communities in Yucatan, which is you know a bit kind of culturally separate from Mexico. It's got its own regional identity. So um, can you tell us how you got started in filmmaking? And I would love to hear a little bit about your work with Ambulante and then how you establish your relationships to the communities, how you decide who you're going to work with. Um, I started with Ambulante because I studied in Ambulante Beyond. It is a, um, um, it is a, a workshop about documentary film. So I make uh, I made um, one short film, it is uh, The Valley of the Land and, and Pash, and it was about Mayan um, topics about agriculture or uh, identity um, by music. And I don't know, um, all, all my work, it is about Mayan communities, but I don't think it is um, a thing that I am searching in, it is, I think, um, topics uh, that it is uh, interesting to me and I want to, to make it uh, or talk about it. So, yeah, um, I started with that, but when I finished with Ambulante Beyond, I started to do my, my, own, my own films um, for myself. And I did uh, what happened to the bees, and um, and now I am um, um, exhibiting um, a snake's mouth in in this festival. And it is um, when I knew the existence of this Mayan community. It is called Chican. Um, I, it was about uh, through the uh, television report, and it was. Um, very short and a little bit exaggerated. And because they say that it was a town where the entire community was deaf and all the inhabitants had the same surnames. And of course, about the particularity of the creation of their language that did not resemble to any other. So when I heard that, uh, it seems incredibly magical and very interesting. Um, so I first imagined a film about the story of the town. So I began to do some research on the internet and decided to go to the community that it, it is like two hours from where I live. So I arrive uh, there and it's a very nice place, very quiet. And I, I, I came with the idea to of learning uh, more about the people who live there. And that trip helped me a lot to understand that nowadays not everyone is deaf. Um, and in fact, uh, fewer people were speaking or using the language because there is uh, a lot of immigration. And the last two um, inhabitants who born um, uh, deaf were, is Heli and the main character of the of the short film and her brother. So uh, it came to me the, the question about 
what would happen if that language became extinct, right? And I think, okay, here's something. Uh, I, I met the, the, the family of, of Heli and I found it very attractive uh, narratively uh, that the four members of the family were deaf. And yeah, um, I wanted that the film could have that magic touch that I felt when I first hear, uh, heard about the place, the silence, the joy, and also a bit of drama. And I think all the, the sequences have a bit of each thing. And I think um, as well the, uh, the, the message of hope and a new beginning remains in the audience. So that was what I was looking for. And when you say the language, you mean Mayan sign language, not yes. even Maya. Right. Exactly. It, it is uh, Mayan, uh, Yucatecan Mayan sign language. Right. And, and it, is, it is unique. It was super surprising. You know, I've seen a lot of Mayan film, um, but this was the first time I'd ever even thought about uh, Yucatec Mayan sign language. Right. Yeah. Yes. So if you haven't seen the film, I strongly recommend it. If you can still see it until tomorrow. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, thank you, Andriana. Um, Eris, your film um, is just a heart-wrenching tale that so many families have dealt with um, when dealing with diseases such as Alzheimer's with a loved one. Um, we focus on the, on the memories we share, but the language here in your film is, is a barrier that emerges between a mother and a daughter. Um, what made you want to share this difficult story? Um, thank you, Cindy. Um, the reason I made the film was um, really twofold and um, also it kind of evolved over the course of um, screening the film and sharing the film. And uh, at first, you know, I think the emotional foundation was inspired by my experience with my own paternal grandmother. Uh, she lived with Alzheimer's for more, more than 15 years before she passed away last year. And um, my father's family is from this village in the Yangtze Delta area. And my grandparents spoke a certain dialect and didn't speak Mandarin. While I, you know, I grew up in the city of Nanjing, I didn't know the dialect, I only spoke Mandarin. So growing up, I was never able to communicate with my grandmother verbally, but at the same time, I never doubted that she loved me through her actions. And later, the other side of the inspiration comes from my own immigration experience, uh, moving to the US and you know, um, starting to navigate a new environment as an ESL speaker, um, starting to realize you know, so much can be lost through language, um, whether it's your personality, your opinion, um, your humor. Um, and I was also struck by the heritage language loss among Asian American communities. So that was the issue, uh, like those two reasons were the initial inspirations when I made the film. And last year, uh, after my grandmother passed away and I wasn't able to go home because of the pandemic, I um, really did some soul searching and realized that while I thought I hadn't lost my heritage, which is my Chinese uh, culture, I actually have lost the part where my father's camp family came from. Like I never learned my father's mother tongue. I um, haven't been to that village for like maybe more than 10 years. And I even never thought about it before my grandmother passed away. And yeah, I really did some soul searching and realizing how I'm actually um, to some level also ruthless and um, really started to also resonate with the other immigrant families who are experiencing the similar generational gap from a whole new perspective. Um, and yeah, I think for me, it's also um, throughout the screening process, I learned so many stories from other families that experienced similar things because the secondary or like third language loss with Alzheimer patients is actually very common. Um, I wanted to share just one of the stories with you here. Uh, it was from a Taiwanese family. 
the daughter only spoke um, obviously Mandarin and English as a Taiwanese American immigrant. But her father, having grown up in the Japanese colonial era back in Taiwan, his mother tongue was actually Japanese. So when the father was got Alzheimer's, he lost the ability to communicate with his family until the very last days. And they just very fortunately had a visiting doctor from Japan so that they were able to make the connection right before the father um, passed away. So um, I really wanted to bring light to, you know, the subject of Alzheimer's caregivers and also the heritage language loss and also the cultural gap that we as immigrants experience, mm -hmm. not just across nations, but also within a nation, because sometimes I feel like people don't realize there are a lot of nuances in culture, even within one regional area. And you you achieved that in an astoundingly short amount of time in your short. So <laughs> yeah. we, we you. were all very moved and, and yeah. appreciated that work. Cindy, back to you. Yeah. I mean, the film itself, I mean, all of them, um, the power of language, the power of community, and how you're able, able to break those barriers. And um, this question is going to go to Tanya. Um, you said that you cut the film one in English and then one in Anishinaabekwin. Um, what was that decision to say, yes, you know what, I'm, I'm, we're going to have a completely separate documentary just in, in that language? Because I know how tough that is um, for just making one documentary and just having just like captions there, but to like literally have somebody sit there and have it completely spoken in that language is really a feat. And I'm really interested to hear how, how that process went. I appreciate the uh, question. Um, I really wanted to make a version of this film in my language, in our language. And, you know, as I said off the top, I mean, my mother was raised by residential school survivors and um, uh, she was taught to um, hate her language, to hate herself, you know. Um, and so it was... Uh, um, I don't have the language and she doesn't either. My family, no one in my family that's alive right now speaks our language. Um, but um, I'm very blessed to um, be connected. You know, um, I think if you are um, from a First Nations community in Canada, um, you are constantly reconnecting as well. Mm -hmm. My family has this very long story, but um, my mother's brothers were taken as part of the 60s scoop where children were taken away and adopted out to white families. And my sister was also adopted out as well. Um, and so there's been so much disconnection. And so it was really important for me to bring language to the film because the language is who we are, you know, um, Eris was just saying that, um, and it's 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 who we are as, as we're connected to the land. You know, the language has humor, um, teaches us about ourselves and who we are as people. And also, too, there's so many different dialects of Anishinaabe. So, like Ujibwe, there's so many of us around, right? And um, there's a um, some more films are done um, with the dialect that's from kind of central. Um, in southern Ontario, um, but there's like an invisible line near Nipigon, Ontario, and all the language changes. And so I wanted to um, to capture this language, you know, my language in in the film. And it's also too the um, the language of the families, you know, the seven brothers. <laughs> um, so the seven youth, they all spoke um, Ujikri, Ujibwe, uh as their first language. English was second. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was very mm -hmm. important wow. to have a version of the film in a language that families could understand. Mm -hmm. um, and it was challenging uh, to record it because it was COVID. Um, mm -hmm. So we had um, some pretty um, strong rules here in Ontario about what you could and could not do. And honestly, we recorded the language version of the film in a super eight motel that served as a, um, <laughs> as, a, as, a as um oh my gosh what's it called as a, as a soundproof room which wasn't um and that's like we work with this incredible guy who managed to get it all done jp um, in a super eight 
Um, yes. And we were lucky, like, and it was done as well, not in Thunder Bay, um, where the film is mostly set. They, we recorded this um, in Kenora, which is about five hours down the highway west. So <laughs> it was it was not easy. And we also did, um, just, to, just so you know, we also did a four-part podcast to go along with the delivery oh. of the film. Oh. And the podcast is um, is half in English and half in Anishinaabewewin. Um, and it's called Where We Are From. And so it's um, it was a lot. It was a lot to deliver all of it in COVID. But we did it. You did. <laughs> Um. <laughs> so I think that like that that reclaiming of the language for the films, for the language the films are in, and now for the names of certain regional festivals, I think it's a huge step in this like road of, you know, decolonization of film to call it like some way, but it's really uh, the final appropriation is to work completely in the language, right? And with all the nuance that can bring, and I was I just thought it was so powerful to see the whole documentary, uh, not in English, right? Not, and I think that we're there. I think that we're there beyond a kind of world cinema for art house theaters. Mm -hmm. We're at a place where people now understand that, that languages contain knowledges, right? And that some things are untranslatable, right? And, and mm -hmm. mother tongue traffics in that kind of limit of like one language overflowing into another and an imperfect translation, right? Mm -hmm. um, in that kind of production vein, uh, talking a little bit more about the actual uh, nuts and bolts of production, uh, Caroline, um, I, I see you've been uh, trained in, in a various disciplines, but also in various languages, being uh, raised in Quebec, gone to school in Spain, and working in French and Anishinaabe in the film Bootlegger. So one thing is to have you be this multi-talented, but you need your crew to also speak all these the language, right? So, for instance, in uh, in your film, Devery, for instance, is Mohawk, but speaks in both French and in Shinabi in the film, which I thought very impressive. <laughs> Can you tell us a bit about how you got to your cast and crew choices? Because the language plays such an important part in actually being able to put the film together. Tell us a bit about that. Language was a part of the film uh, directly from the script writing. Uh, I grew up in, in mostly in the Utawe region, which is, you know, French, the reality of the French, English, and Anishinaabe Moen being very, very present. And I wanted to have that reality in the film. And I knew I wanted the main character of Mani to be, to not re necessarily speak the language of her community to add to the displacement. Um, it, it's interesting because. Uh, my, my mother's family uh, in Kiriganzibi, they, they're Anglophone, but because my father's from France, I grew up mostly in a French-speaking uh, family. And uh, every time I would go back to see my family, I, I felt a little bit disconnected. It was hard for me to fully connect. Uh, and I wanted to bring that to the, to the character of Manny too, because it is also part of our legacy and part of that baggage that we carry and part also of you know, assimilation policies that was at the root of the film. Um, I wanted the film to be in Anishinaabe Moen just because, well, one of the main reasons is we never see that in Quebec uh, cinema uh, yeah. itself. It's just never, never present. There's very little Indigenous films in Quebec, but uh, to have the, that in the language was very, very important to me. And within the Indigenous cinema, there's very little Francophone uh, films as well. So for me, it was important to, to be able to contribute a little bit uh, to that landscape. And it was uh, a lot of the uh, characters in the casting were coming from different nations. We had Inu people at Tikamek, uh, of course, Anishinaabe, a lot of the community members where we shot the film. Uh, but I wanted um, you know, to have that diversity of voices as well because it is a fiction film. Uh, it, it, it was important for me that um, I'm not the one saying um, it's good or bad to bring in alcohol within a community. It's not my place to say that. That would be, a, I would think, a colonial approach to, to say what is good or bad. Uh, but I wanted to commu the community uh, to speak for, for itself and to have that diversity of voices within it. Um, and that's something that, um, you know, in Latino studies, uh, there's been this whole idea of borderland and bordering and being bordered. But I grew up on uh, near Niagara Falls. Um, I grew up in Seneca territory and 
I got television from Canada and I, you know, got, got some of the French. And so when you think about um, each territory being multilingual, it just really opens up a different geography for you and this porousness that we can even have our, our own kind of internal code switching that happens depending on who's around. Um, I thought that was so well knit into the whole the whole dramatic arc, but you just seeing it in terms of knowing some of the actors and knowing that they're not speaking in their first language is very impressive. So congrats on that. I hope I hope to see more of that. I would be very excited um, to see that. Thank you. Cindy. Yeah, um, this question's for you, Adriana. Um, your film for us, definitely was so unique in the fact that um, I have never seen an entire film in sign language and especially from an indigenous culture. So my question to you is um, what kind of accommodations, I mean, how did you navigate the language barrier since off, uh, off this conversation, you said that you, you didn't speak the Yucatan Mayan language, but yet you are doing this whole film on that. Not only that, but the Mayan sign language. So um, how did you, you know, navigate that that barrier? You know, did you have a translator? Like, how did you even, you know, decide, hey, I'm gonna go on this community, I'm gonna do this. And um, what kind of accommodations, like with you and your crew, like to do, a, a, you know, basically a short film about does this incredible way of just communicating and the story behind that? Yeah, uh, yeah, it was difficult. Um, one of the things that worried me the most at the beginning uh, of this project was the communication. I um, was used to talk with my protagonist and gaining their trust um, through the conversation. But yeah, this time I, I couldn't do it. Even when, when I work, um, with my previous films, um, the, the main characters, um, in addition to speaking Mayan, spoke Spanish. So it was um, very easy to communicate. But yeah, the, this project was uh, absolutely uh, different. Um, luckily, um, Heli's cousin, uh, who is very co close to her, knows the sign, um, the sign language very well and also trusts on her. So Delmi was our main interpreter. And uh, Delmi's father, Don Simon, also helped us to communicate with the family. And I think with this experience, I learned to improve my observation and uh, interaction skills because um, by not speaking the sign language, uh, the sign language or Mayan, the only thing I had was my, my body and my uh, facial expression it, it's a, a language right as well and um, so the interesting um, it was the a time when when something happened in in the in the crew that we began to understand the situation and some signs and I, I'm very happy because I have my own sign it it's it, it, it is, yeah, because I because when I went, I, I had short hair. So that's how they yeah. baptized me. And it was a, a, a beautiful, immersive uh, experience. That's wonderful. Um, yeah. Would you ever consider doing a project of the size again? Like, you know, another community that also has that language barrier, like sign language or something like that. Because it seems like that's what you do. You go into these wonderful communities and somehow just make it so intrinsically beautiful. And this to me, you know, stands out not only for, for this film, but like in general, now we're seeing films that are now in sign language. Um, Coda is an example, an American film that got nominated for an Oscar. We're having films even in the Marvel series that are not going to be in sign language. So, you know, I you see this, you know, you know, trend that it's happening and it's really wonderful. Um, because again, it's the mother tongue, but as well as like, you know, what you're speaking. So um, Amalia. Yeah, we're uh, we've shown films with no dialogue at Mother Tongue. We've shown films that talk about tattooing or body paint, like we're very open to what mother tongue could be or could mean. Um, we understand that there's many different ways of speaking. Um, my question is for Eris. Um, 
the power of our matriarchs is present in many of our films uh, this year. And in your short, we find loss and disconnection, but also a powerful reconnection to the world of the ancestors. How did you find your creative way to address healing in your film? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I just wanted to take a moment uh, and just applaud on all the other directors who talked about the language barrier they dealt with, because I didn't realize that some of you guys didn't understand the language um, itself. So I felt very lucky. Um, going back to the question about healing, I think from the beginning, I was very adamant about this story being both a mother-daughter story, but also beyond. So in the story itself, um, I referenced this um, ancient Chinese poem that is uh, really well known basically for any Chinese language uh, speaker. We would, the, this is going to be the very first poem that you learn. And it's about homesickness and nostalgia. And um, I used it in the film as a tribute to our legacy uh, and, and our la language. And also in the same scene, um, spoiler alert, the protagonist also has this vision of her own offspring. So kind of extending this legacy into the future. Um, there is this idiom in Chinese, which loosely translates into um, what's in the past cannot be saved, but what's in the future is to have a chance. So I think, you know, the film is definitely about grieving, but at the same time, I also wanted to show that there is still hope. Um, there is hope for our next generations. There is hope to carry out this legacy, this heritage, uh, heritage on. And, you know, for me, for myself, making this film itself is an action of that. And yeah, I am hopeful of, uh, yeah, I'm hopeful for the future where we still like keep and preserve our legacy um, in any way we can. And where is the film going next? Um, so in case somebody watches this next week and can't go back and watch the film, where, where can we see your, your work next? Um, that is a um, secret, I want to say. <laughs> okay. you, can still, you can still view it um, at the Mother Tongue Festival until tomorrow. Um, but I, I'm i hoping one day I will share it um, on the more public platform. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we can all access the story and um, share our insights and experiences together. And I, I really um, was thinking about what you said about how screening the work shaped the final piece. I thought that was a um, really nice tidbit to share because it isn't always like a work of art that just falls out of your head impeccable. It really needs so much input. And that's the thing about filmmaking, right? That um, I find is, um, is is such a learning process. Even if you know your craft, you're consist constantly learning and refining through your, your feedback with your peers. And um, in the case of some of the indigenous fictions that I've, I've worked with, feedback from the actor saying, I wouldn't say it like that, you know, and kind of changing it around to what would make more sense and what feels more comfortable. So um, there's something to be said about um, understanding that it's a process and that has iterations. And, and like Tanya was saying, even different versions for different audiences. Mm. So um, unless we have pressing questions from the public, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the audience response and the impact on the community that your films have had. Uh, Tanya, let's circle back to you. Um, if you could tell us a bit about what the response has been. It's a super powerful film. I need to hear, I need to unmute you. It's okay. Sorry about that. Perfect. <laughs> um, well, sadly, since this film, um, was released during COVID. I, I know I told you guys in the um, um, in our, our um, dress rehearsal that I've actually never seen it in a theater. And um, it's been at festivals, but most of the festivals were virtual. It played at the TIFF Bell Lightbox as part of the Toronto Palestinian Film Festival. And sadly, I was in Thunder Bay when that happened, so I missed it. Um, so I've only seen it on like, um, well, a large, one tiny, well, one large screen. And the most special moment actually for me is when we screened the film in a classroom um, in Thunder Bay mm -hmm. at the first 
high school, Dennis Franklin Camardi, where six of the seven students that died went to school. And we showed them the um, Anishinaabewin version of the film. Um, and it was, uh, it was, we only got, it was sad because the, the bell rang, so they had to go to their next class, but they yeah. saw the first 20 minutes in language. And I was just, it was so powerful for me um, because a lot of the kids, you know, they're from the communities that the seven went um, are from. And some of them, uh, of the kids had family members, cousins and second cousins that died. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, it was truly powerful. Um, and we also, uh, um, there was a music festival when COVID was not happening um, called Wake the Giant, which is in Thunder Bay. And it aims to welcome all the kids from all the communities in the North um, that are coming into high school. And they showed clips of the film on this massive stage and all of these people from Thunder Bay were there. And that was really, really good because um, as, as for those who have seen the film, the film is very much about racism and about a divided city. Um, and Thunder Bay has always been a city of us and them. So um, it, was, it was a pretty powerful moment. Does, um, when you have a live screening like that, do you have, do you bring like grief counselors or people who are prepared mm -hmm. to help you navigate that? Or is because, mm -hmm. or you haven't had so many live screenings that you're not even there yet? <laughs> yeah, I haven't had many, uh, well, and it was only like blips of the mm -hmm. film that was shown. But um, what was beautiful about that particular evening at uh, Wake the Giant was that I brought some of the kids on stage from the school so, um, you know, we would stand there and they would just play little, little blurbs, two little blurbs got played. And um, that was, that was grateful. But when I speak, I, I always have people um, in audiences, especially when I'm in community. Um, that's something that in the North, many of our communities offer that, you know, um, and we always have somebody there um, or multiple people there um, who can handle people who are triggered by what right. they're seeing and what they're hearing because sadly that's just a reality and i have to say even as mother tongue team we've grappled with that when we've shown difficult films um we, we thought about what are how far do we go because we're not trained right so how, mm -hmm. how do we handle this content and and i'm just uh going to share that for us um some of the films uh, we're holding until we can have them live so that we can contain that audience and do it responsibly. Uh, the internet resists a certain kind of, uh, of film. And then there's other films that I, I just said to the team, I love this film. I want to show it in a live audience. I, I don't mm -hmm. feel that we can just release it and leave people to grapple on their own with that. And we, we've shown some difficult topics. Um, you know, mother tongue films are intimate and tend to go places that are less commonly traveled. It's, it's very interesting. Again, we're all learning about this as we develop this festival. It's been a real learning experience too. And that's something that we, um, I think it'll be interesting to see when and if hopefully we are back live, uh, how we handle that content. We've also gone in the other direction and we showed blood quantum. <laughs> we had to figure out a way to filter the audience. <laughs> and that was also with the government of Quebec support uh, of, of, uh, of um, of that film so we managed to make it uh because they donated uh something that we could regulate the entry so but it's complicated you know and you can't do that um you can't just say not recommended for minors and leave it at that you know there's this responsibility you have uh, as curators to to um be there for your audience right mm -hmm. so um we would love to figure out a way to stay in touch and share any resources that you might be developing along the way that's a great thing about Mother Tongue. We have like alums and, and relationships from previous festivals. Um, so I guess we would go to um, Adriana, if you could um, tell us what the response was in the community. And I'm curious to see if anybody from the village is interested in training in film or interested in, in filmmaking. Yeah, um, I'm going to, to answer in, in Spanish because my... My brain hurts. <laughs> I understand. Problema. <laughs> um, um, sí, bueno, eh, el cortometraje les gustó mucho, sobre todo eh, a la familia. Estrenamos en 2020, pero con la pandemia no hemos podido hacer una proyección en la comunidad. 
Eh, uh -huh. Pero bueno, lo han visto en los celulares o en computadoras y, y bueno, me han dicho que, que, que están muy, muy contentos, ¿no? Y, y sí, cuando estábamos haciendo la, la película, ellos estaban muy interesados en saber cómo usábamos la cámara. Hubo un momento en el que Heli me dijo que quería ser fotógrafa, ¿no? Entonces, eh, creo que fue una muy buena experiencia también de, pues de que ellos pudieran ser parte de, de la grabación. Incluso eh, hubieron momentos en los que ellos ya sabían cómo ponerse el micrófono, ¿no? Porque, digo, eh, tal vez no, no, digo, no hablaban, pero hacían sonidos, ¿no? Con los movimientos. Y, y sí, justamente me contactó una organización que, eh, que lo que hace es darles cámaras a las a comunidades o a personas que de alguna manera estén en riesgo de perder sus, sus lenguas y para que ellos hagan registros documentales, ¿no? Si, tal vez no con una idea de, de cine como tal, sino es como más bien libre lo que ellos quieran y estoy a punto de volver a la comunidad con la cámara para poderles entregarles a Heli y, y a Delmi pues el equipo para que ellas puedan hacer sus sus propias películas. Got it. Great. Um, so, yes, they love the short, um, especially the family. And while the film premiered in 2020, because it hit during the pandemic, we haven't been able to have a live screening in the village yet. Um, but the people have actually seen it through their cell phones or on screen somehow, and they're happy with it. And while uh, we were shooting, um, many were very interested in our cameras and Heli manifested that she was interested in photography in particular. And it was really interesting for them to be a part of the shoot and the production. They learned how to mic themselves up because even though they're, they, they, they're not speaking into those mics, there's ambient noise, they're making gestures. And, and even if they're not speaking, there's recording. Um, so an organization approached me and they give cameras to communities or people that, are, uh, that have at-risk languages so that they can document their languages. So they contacted me and these are not going to be, uh, you know, ex like films for out out exterior circulation necessarily, but um, I am going to be returning soon to the community to hand over that equipment so that they can make their own films. That's great. Gracias, Adriana. Um, and Caroline. Well, I feel extremely privileged to have been the opening film of Mother Tongue uh, Festival. So could you make wish for this? Uh, really amazing. And uh, of course, uh, we also uh, had the film come out during the pandemic. Um, it was important to me that the community uh, where we shot the film in Kirigan City were the first one to see uh, the film before anyone else. So we had a drive-in uh, projection, which uh, which was really great. Uh, the only great. thing is, uh, of course, you don't have, you know, uh, the feedback at the end. We had a lot of uh, honking, yeah. which was <laughs> really, really fun. Um, so we, we did that. And then it, it had a, you know, a premiere in Montreal and was also an opening film for a festival. So I think it, uh, the film just arrives at a right time. Uh, it, it seems like it's an appropriate time for these types of stories to come out. And I, I'm really grateful about that. And so far, it's been, you know, traveling to film festivals and slowly starting to um, come out of Canada, play in the United States mm -hmm. and Europe now. Uh, and we'll see what the response is uh, outside of Canada. Uh, it mm -hmm. just uh, got released on video on demand uh, as of yesterday. So oh. I'm also intrigued to see what a larger public uh, will think about it. And uh, if it because I do think cinema is about uh, sparking dialogue. Um, so I'm hoping to see uh, what comes next with it. So don't be shy and tell us what platform is it on demand? I think it's Vimeo on demand. If I'm really? correct, yes. Okay. <laughs> well, follow Mother Tongue, and and we'll we'll keep you abreast of that. Um, I can't help but mention that this uh, this is one of the first official events. This Mother Tongue Film Festival is one of the first official events of the Decade of Indigenous Languages that was established by the UN and coordinated by UNESCO. So um, I feel like there will be future avenues for your films to keep going through sister festivals that are also working specifically in, in, in languages, right? So we have 10 years ahead to really draw attention to this kind of work. And so I wanna, I wanna thank you all. Um, we've had some lovely comments coming in, a lot of love coming in through the, the chat. And um, please um, 
feel free to share this conversation. If you watched it and enjoyed it, share it with other people and go, go and watch the films if you haven't already. Um, we've got a, just five more minutes, but if anybody would like to um, close or uh, say goodbye to whoever's been joining us, I'll let you do that before I close. Nope. Um, well, I, I want to, to, to answer a question. The, the organization is Speaking yes. Place. Mm. And they work with um, um, many um, states in Mexico, um, and that's all I want to to thank you for for the for the invitation. I, I'm so glad to to be with with you, and I hope to um, to to be here again <laughs> in another year, maybe with 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 <laughs> another film. And yeah, thanks. Thanks for this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I, I feel like I should answer a question too, because you did as well. Um, any negative reaction from the government giving the film shows um, systemic racism? Not from the government uh, per se. Um, you know, there's um, lots of institutional racism in Thunder Bay mm -hmm. and in Canada. Um, the entire country actually has a quiet racism when it comes to Indigenous people that has been there since well, for the last 150 years. Um, but uh, yeah, we do. Um, I've been lucky so far, you know, um, but I, I don't read a lot of my emails. <laughs> it's just put it that way. I, I also write and I speak um, about what's happening to our people. So I get a lot of, um, of interesting reaction um, from the work that I do. So, um, but not from the government per se, because Canada is going through a reckoning right now with um, the role that they have played as a nation um, and mm -hmm. as various governments with our residential schools. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's happening. It's, it's uh, cascading across the continent where mm -hmm. um, we're seeing anniversaries of certain um, agreements that have to be redone, have to be rewritten. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm from Chile and we are in a moment of constitutional reform, and the first president of the constitutional assembly is a Mapuche linguist. You know, it was an incredible thing to see happen—a woman suddenly address you know the whole country in a platform that was never had before. So, we're hopeful that um, mm. we're seeing this kind of reckoning. It's and it's hard, and and that's why issues of repair, dialogue, mm -hmm. and reparation, and a sort of rewriting of history are, are, are really necessary, and I think uh, crucial in, in this time. Um, anybody else have a, I think, I think those are the questions that came in. I, I missed them. I'm sorry. But uh, anything, anything anybody else wants to say to say goodbye? Um, yeah, I just want, want to quickly say that um, thank you so much for, you know, offering this platform for us to show our film. And when I made my film, I made it for the Asian American community, um, the Asian diaspora community. And uh, throughout the screening, I have had so much uh, positive responses for people outside of the communities and made me realize, you know, it's the power of film that it's, it's uh, kind of transcends mm -hmm. the cultures, the regions, mm -hmm. and then helps us, you know, connect together as one humanity. I think that's very precious, especially in this kind of divided world. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. I, I think thank that's you. a wonderful closing. Beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> that was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for that. Um, so thank you. Thank you to all who've joined us. Thank you, especially to our filmmakers and yes. to our mother tongue team, our mm -hmm. captioner, Karen, our wonderful ASL interpreter, uh, Jenny Blake, who's helped us bring this event to you and to the backstage folks you don't see, Sarah Rothman, who's amazing, and Alexander Taggart, who make all of this possible. Mm -hmm. I um, I encourage you to visit the Recovering Voices page on Facebook to get notified about future events. And you can also find us on YouTube, visit our website, and come back here for the closing night program tomorrow. So thank you very much, uh, Chaltumai and Tokayal, and everybody, um, if you're not home, may you get home safe. And thank you for, for sharing this time with us. Muchas gracias. Thank you, everyone. Miigwech. Miigwech. Thank you. Bye. Chaltumai.